Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubana e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, we have Eric Banholtz, co-founder of Beard Brand. They sell products for the bearded lifestyle, such as beard oils, beard wash, beard softener, beard combs, and much more. They've built the company to over $120,000 per month in revenue and were featured on the hit series Shark Tank. And Eric even had the pleasure of having Lori touch his beard on the show. Eric, thanks for joining me. What is going on, Jeremy? And thank you for such a warm and friendly introduction. Happy to be on the show. Yeah, definitely love the beard. Um, what does your wife think about the beard? Like she digs the evolution it, you know? of the beard. Like, there's not a lot of many uh, guys out there who rock beards without the permission of their wives. So <laughs> was I, she uh, was she timid? Was she skeptical at first, or was she always on board? Well, she always preferred me with a beard, and, and mm. my length in general was about the length of your beard. Mm. So that's what I normally had. Yeah. And then um, I decided to grow it out and told her I was going to grow it for like six months or a year. And she's like, I don't know about that. <laughs> and then I'd get to the six-month mark, and uh, she'd be okay with me ha- at that length. And I'm like, I'm going to go for the 12 months. She's like, I don't know about that. And then uh, I got to the 12 month and I was like, I'm thinking about trimming it back. And she's like, eh, I don't know about that. So, <laughs> you know, I think they, my wife tends to prefer, you know, whatever, uh, whatever look I'm rocking. Yeah. Although currently she, I think she wants me to cut my head hair. So, okay, let's yeah. go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are your top two favorite beards of all time? Well, you know, uh, not trying to sound like a narcissist, but uh, I, I love my beard, not not because of the way it looks, but just because it's my own, <laughs> right. and it's something that's really ingrained with who I am. And then, of course, uh, my dad uh, has had a beard. He doesn't currently have a beard, but when he has a beard, it's, it's something that I look up to. So it's, yeah. uh, I'm in Chicago, you know, Chicago Cubs fan, and so, you know, Ariata obviously rocks the, the beard. Um, and so, you know... Preparing for this, I I wanted to hear about, I was really fascinated with the first beard competition. How did you prepare for this and and tell me about what it was like? Dude, uh, beard competitions are something else. Like they are, uh, they're a ton of fun if you've never been to one before. It's almost like going to uh, like a Halloween costume year round, but a Halloween costume for like bearded folks. (laughs) And um, I, uh, when I was growing my beard, I, I really got into it. I got into like how to take care of your beard, how to grow it quickly, and uh, like the culture and the lifestyle behind guys who, who really love their beards. And beard competitions are, are part of that. At the time, there's a show going on called Whisker Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's uh, really how I got into it uh, or, or wanting to go to the, the competition was through that show. And then yeah. there's one in Portland, Oregon, which... Uh, at the time, I lived in Spokane, Washington. It was only a few-hour drive, so got a couple of our our buddies, and we drove out there. and And uh, I I had no expectations of of what it was going to be or what it was going to be like. And then I got there, and I just kind of uh, fell in love with with the people and the atmosphere and and just uh, the lifestyle. And it was just a, a ton of fun. Do you go fun. there to actually compete, or yeah, you I, go- I competed. So what do you, yeah, what do you compete in? How do they? Tell me about it, it was the uh, 2012 West Coast uh, Beard and Mustache Championship. Okay. And I competed in the, the full natural beard under a foot. So uh, uh, it's funny to think about like. So guys. how do they rate that? How do they pick the winner? Uh, so uh, I've actually ended up judging a few competitions as well. Oh. And, and typically it's going to be on like the color and the mass, the density, the length, uh, the shape of the mustache, uh, just like the texture. I mean, um, every competition kind of grades it slightly differently, but right. it's just however cool. So it you is. say natural beard is there like what's an unnatural beard like stero- like someone taking steroids <laughs> or something? <laughs> no, uh, so that would be a styled beard. Oh, for so people would like style it, and that's a separate competition. Right, right. Well, it's the same competition, oh. just different categories. Different categories. Gotcha. Okay, because I noticed like in one of the videos you said 
you know, hormones really affect the growth and the thickness. So I don't know. For all I know, people are doing steroids to win the beard competition. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no testing of, of blood work. Like <laughs> so they're a lot, lot less informed. Don't want to give anyone ideas out there. Well, um, you can't really win in any money, too, so, uh, or get any much fame and, and glory. Yeah, what's the prize? What do, what do you... Uh, Usually it's uh, bragging rights and a pretty cool trophy. Okay, so, yeah. Uh, and the prize is really hanging out with a bunch of people and, and having a good time for the night. So. And you realize something, though, about the people at the first beard competition. Yeah, you know, um, for me, when I grew my beard out, uh, I, it's, I've, I, was, I was and I am, I'm a business professional. You know, mm-hmm. I'm a graphic designer, financial advisor, and, and uh, no one in that world had facial hair like I was the only guy and maybe some people had facial hair was more of your length but no one had like a big beard mm-hmm. and and I didn't think that should be limited to you know just the bikers and the hippies and the outdoorsmen and the lumberjacks like right. I thought we should be able to grow big beards too if we wanted to right um and it was at that competition that I realized that there were other guys out there like me you know there are other guys who um, wanted to wear a bigger beard and also had a wife and kid and had uh, they were involved in their community and you know they had jobs and were just right. normal guys you right. know yeah so uh, it kind of inspired me to uh, try to unite the community and show the other guys out yeah. there that hey you can rock a beard if you want to and, and here's how yeah so discovering the what you call the urban beardsman yeah 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 so I like I I had to like there is no term for guys like me, and and just to make it easy, you know, um, I I never considered myself like a hipster, although a lot of people describe me as a hipster. But um, I've always been like a, a business guy and an entrepreneur yeah. first. Like that's yeah. who I really identify with. But um, I wanted something that was more in, encompassing that wasn't really defined on like coffee and music and iron not irony. Like it's it's more about like professionalism and, and style and, and drive and passion and independence and freedom. Like, right. uh, so we had to create a new term to, to, to describe that. And, and for us, that was urban beard. So you created the term urban beardsman. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty good. I like that. You like it? Yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So I want you to talk about the urban beardsman because we talked right before, which I thought was interesting. You're like, you know, Jeremy is not just, it's not about the products, yeah. right? So what's it about? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's about, um, helping men feel confident with who they are or who they want to be right. and giving them the tools. So um, a lot of uh, maybe, you know, we've had a lot of competition pop up and and there's always been this like hyper masculinity, like you're not a real man unless you have a beard or, you know, some, some inappropriate things that I probably shouldn't say on your show um, that are derogatory to women. You know, oh, really? like that's oh. not us. Like we want to say like, you're free to grow a beard and you're mm-hmm. free to, to shave a beard and it doesn't define your masculinity. You know, it doesn't define who you are as a man, um, but who you want to be internally, like we want to give you those tools to be that and, and not right. feel pressure to be someone who you're not. Yeah. And, you know, w- one of those tools that we provide yeah. are beard grooming products. You know, they yeah. help you look good in a professional environment but we also provide a lot more we yeah what else do you give me some examples of what else because i would definitely will we'll dig into the products and everything like that but tell me what else yeah i mean so like beard brand started off as a content website as a way for guys to be able to find information yeah. about taking care of their beard so we've got urbanbeardsman.com which we provide daily content on how to dress yourself how to have style how to rock mm. it with your beard yeah. how to find clothes how to Mm. look great how to feel confident and then we've got uh, of course our youtube channels which uh yeah. provide a lot of help and assistance and and then we've got our tumblr page which is like providing inspiration right so it can yeah. provide guidance on you know how you want to get you know what what point you want to get to in your life and where you want to go and and really have that guidance and that drive rather than just letting life come to you uh but yeah. you take that control and you take that action so I mean, those to me are as much of, of yeah. what we do as a company as selling the products. Yeah, yeah. And the I products mean, just kind of fund for us. The products really kind of fund that other stuff. Yeah, and I do notice. I mean, your the information content you put out is is pretty enormous. Um, and I want you to talk. I was going to save this for later, but I definitely want you to talk about 
the social media presence and how that's grown and what you've done to grow it. Um, maybe start with YouTube. You know, you have some really cool how-to videos. You guys have over 70,000 subscribers on YouTube. I think I was, I was watching one, all men should grow a year uh, the yeah. other day. And you have like over 100,000 views on that. So tell me about YouTube, how you grew that and, and you know, what you plan to do in the future for people who like, I want to I wanna grow a following and, you know, on YouTube and provide great content. Well, so the for the first thing is like growing a YouTube channel is a lot of friggin' hard work. <laughs> it's not tell me, that, tell me about that hard work early on today because people see that and go, oh, he just probably blew up overnight. He's got seventy thousand, but it wasn't always that easy. What was, oh no, man, yeah. dude! Like, let me tell you, like, I, nothing in my life has been easy, um, or at least to me, it doesn't seem like it's been easy. Right. But it's been fun. So yeah. it's it's. I wouldn't say it's been difficult because I enjoy doing it. But um, YouTube, man, that first year, I think I had like 300 subscribers after like 12 months. And, uh, and what were you, know, you doing in that first year? Pardon me? What were you doing in the first year um, as far as content goes? So and, my, you know. my first year, the content really just sucked. Like, frankly, it was, uh, it was, I had like no vision, no guidance, no strategy with YouTube. So I was just going up there and maybe one month I'd create a video and I, I know one video is just of me. It's like 30 seconds, and I just go like this. <laughs> like, like, that's all the video. And I thought, I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to go viral. There's going to be, like, billions. And I'm like, what? Looking back on it, I'm like, what the hell? What, what was I thinking? Like, this is idiot. Um, but the, I did have <laughs> one hilarious. video that yeah. did really well. Like, yeah. uh, it was, a, a like, a how-to beard grooming video. And, mm. and that's when I kind of realized, like, this is what the people on YouTube want. These mm. are the videos I need to, to create. So it was really like being in tune with what kind of videos uh, my channel was finding success with and then creating more videos along those lines. And, yeah. and it kind of built on itself from there. So mm -hmm. you know, the first year was only 300 subscribers. Mm -hmm. And then the next year it was like 1,000. And then it was like 10,000. And then, you know, it, like the, the beauty with YouTube versus every other social media platform out there is they really reward creators. Like they want you to create, and if you create a lot, they're going to thank you, and they are going to show you uh, to more people. So it's uh, unlike Facebook, where if you create more, they're like, "Hey, give me money, man." You can uh, only write. You got to pay to play out. on the Facebook, you know. So. Uh, so when did yeah. you see? When did you? You took a. You saw a turning point with the how-to videos. Uh, yeah. What else did you discover with your your YouTube creation journey? I mean, with YouTube, um, for me, like, I, I'm a public book, and, and I'm pretty open, yeah. and I share pretty much anything everyone asks me, so I'm always answering uh, comments uh, to the best of my abilities, and, and responding to things, and getting engaged, and yeah. watching other people's YouTube channels, and commenting on their videos, and, um, you know, and, and then sharing it on different communities as well, you know, so I, I brought people who weren't on YouTube to the YouTube channel, or or took the conversation to, to different areas, and, mm -hmm. and of course was active in, in these beard uh, competitions and these beard clubs. And I mean, mm -hmm. I lived what I was talking about. So I yeah. think what's really important is that authenticity. Um, and I'd like to say that I'm 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 pretty authentic. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's really a core core attribute to, to YouTube as well. It's just being who you are. Yeah, I mean, your guy noticed that right off the bat um, when I was reading your about page. Like this guy is more open than way majority of the people out there. What's the most personal thing that you've shared with someone? Um, I mean, the, like we're pretty public about our, our infertility tr troubles. Yeah, um, which I think is a very generally a, a very private affair but for yeah. me like I needed to talk with other people to, to work through that and to overcome the challenges and and uh, you know I feel for anyone out there who's struggling with infertility right now yeah. it was probably the, the darkest point of my life yeah uh, that's what I'm referring to with that was on your about page I was yeah. like holy crap Eric this is like personal this is some deep stuff yeah. um, what made you decide to share that well um, I mean it was um, so I don't know if I shared that on my about page, but or I shared a, it on the, the Shark Tank page. No, you definitely. Oh, maybe it was a Shark Tank page. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. It was one of the pages. Yeah. So the the reason was, um, you know, uh, one of the things we talked about on Shark Tank was uh, our infertility struggles, and and I wanted 
to kind of have our voice out there mm. um, if if they included that in in the uh, conversation. So it was kind of uh, in tune to that as well. And uh, you know, I've uh, I've talked about it in my YouTube videos, mm -hmm. I think as well. And you know, it's part of my life, and and yeah. I think it's a way that. Um, I can help others out there who are struggling yeah. uh, with it because it is typically uh, such a private thing that yeah. people don't even know where to go to, to get inspiration, to get help, right. and, and to, to find that community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, so for people who didn't watch Shark Tank and didn't read it, just uh, if you could just talk a little bit about what happened and maybe some advice for people who may be struggling with that right now because it is a really, really difficult subject. Yeah, I mean, uh, so in regards to, to Shark Tank? No, yeah, no. I mean, what happened with um, the what? the infertility? What? Oh, infertility. Yeah. yeah. So my wife and I uh, obviously were, were infertile and, and we had to go the science route mm. is the way I like to, to phrase it. So uh, the old-fashioned way didn't work. I don't know what I was doing wrong. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for us, there's there's a lot of struggles with, with just the emotions and, and, and the, the fact that you you want to have a family and, and you want to become a father and a mother, mm -hmm. um, but that's outside your control. And, you know, for a lot of people, like how they view themselves and how they plan to having their lives involves being a parent right. and, and have children. And, and when that's outside your control, you know, there's things like adoption and adoption. While, you know, it's easy for people to say, hey, why don't you just adopt a kid? You know, there's a lot of steps involved in the adoption process. And not only that, like, you're putting yourself out there for people to screen you and to say like, hey, you're worthy to have a kid right, or you're right. not worthy to have my kid or, you know, whatever it is. And then the complexity of, of dealing with, you know, the, the adopted uh, child's uh, birth mother and, and just like there's yeah. so many things that go on and, and just like uh, so many emotional aspects. Um, you know, we, we went through IVF uh, three times. And then on the fourth time, we, we finally had success. So, like, mm. each one of those times, and, and even before, like, leading up to It's like to a IVF, roller coaster. Yeah, yeah. Like, you get your, your hopes up and you get your emotions up. That, hey, because you're doing it because you think it's, it's going to work. Right. And you hope uh, that it's going to work and that things will come into fruition. And then yeah. when you get the bad news, it's just that roller coaster and, and the long car rides home of, of just it's horrible. remorse and... and it's like a death of a very close death in your family every single right. time you right. do as a failed procedure. Yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate you sharing that on your site, and it's just you know um, very powerful. Um, yeah. So, talk about Shark Tank for a second. You know what happened on Shark Tank that we didn't see, and then I want to just talk about the actual experience itself. Yeah. So I mean uh, the. Uh, our, our total time in front of the sharks, or my total time in front of the sharks, was about 45 minutes. And they cut that down to uh, about five minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I signed a bunch of papers that say I, I can't really talk about stuff that's not public. So mm, gotcha. um, I can kind of talk about like uh, maybe my experiences of dealing with sharks. Well, yeah, what were you thinking before you went out there? So, I mean, we are super excited about uh, being on the show and the opportunity of partnering up with. Uh, sharks to be able to take our business to the mm -hmm. next level and mm -hmm. and for us like uh, we are very excited about our business and and what we've done to this point I, I think uh, you know what what we've done isn't the norm for a business and the success we've had uh, isn't what happens with most businesses and and we're very fortunate for that and we recognize that but it's yeah. still been very challenging for us as well and um, but looking through like all the other Shark Tank episodes like my thought is like you know, how are we going to deal with like five offers? Because right. what we've done is so incredible and, and what we're building is so revolutionary. We're changing the way that men are grooming their faces and, and we're creating a whole new industry. Like we're creating the beard care market, which did not exist, um, you know, before our company started. So uh, I was like, man, we're going to have to get on all these offers and how am I going to, you know, put them down nicely and not feel like a... Um, Kind of like a, a jerk or something. A jerk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or like a, you know. But we didn't get any offers, which, which really just, it, frankly, it kind of shocked me and surprised me. I wasn't, I wasn't planning that at all. Like yeah. I wasn't 
Did you have a strategy going in like uh, I have in mind? I want this. I would like to ideally have this one if I didn't have anyone else. Or? Yeah, so we, we targeted uh, Damon as, mm-hmm. as kind of like our, our top, top shark. Yeah. We view Beard Brand as a brand and, and kind of what he did mm-hmm. with FUBU. Yeah. His ability to build a lifestyle brand with, with apparel was more in line with, with how we're building Beard Brand. Yeah. Um, he was so the last really, one in at the end. So Yeah, you know, and, and we did our we did our pitch. We called him out in our pitch. And, and he's the only guy with facial hair, even though it's like a – a small goatee. At least he does rock a little bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought, like for a moment there, that he was going to come in with an offer. But I think, you know, they kind of like the sharks kind of feed off of themselves as well. Like, you know, they see everyone else get in there, they also want to get in there. Mm-hmm. And then I think they see no one else jumping on board, and they kind of get cold feet as well. So I think uh, maybe if I caught Damon on a different day, you know, we we may have been telling a different story. But Was there, and maybe you can't talk about this, but it sounded like at the end he almost wanted to invest. And yeah. and they may have cut this out, but it almost like I felt like, and maybe you couldn't have done that, did you think about going with a counteroffer back to him or was that cut out? No, no, I didn't do any kind of counteroffer. And, and the other thing is we're really confident with our business. Mm-hmm ability to grow our business and, and we found a lot of success up to this point so yeah. we're not a desperate company you yeah. know and, and we're not going to give up the world um the sharks bring a lot of value mm-hmm. um but there is a tangible amount of the value and and we weren't going to undersell that was your valuation you were sticking to it yeah yeah, yeah. i mean we we left a little bit of, of room in there to negotiate i think what, what did we offer like 15 percent uh 15 percent for four hundred thousand. Okay, so I think we were willing to go up to like 20% equity mm-hmm. uh, for the same amount. So we would have gone down to a $2 million valuation mm-hmm. at the time. So I think, um, you know, we did leave some room in there, but we did our due diligence as well on, on what the, the market rate for a company of our, our size would be and, and right. our, you know, IP portfolio yeah. and, and our, our volume and, and stuff like that. So I felt very, very confident with, with yeah. our. Our valuation. I was surprised you didn't get an offer as well. What was the, the after effects like? It was good. I mean, like uh, like the, the day of, like I had Google Analytics open and I think there's like 7,000 simultaneous users and it was just like this giant spike and I was watching a map of like all the cities, like where the cities were wow. loading of people watching it and you could just kind of see it flow mm-hmm. from East Coast to West Coast uh, as it got aired in the different That's time cool. zones. Yeah. And then... Uh, you know, there's uh, that, that weekend sales was just it was a really good, good uh, month, and then it was perfect timing too because it just kind of led up to the holiday season when, you know, I think people threw it in for stocking stuffers and. So what uh, were sales really, like? I mean, our product's a great product. It it sells itself. Yeah. So. What were sales like that month of Shark Tank? Uh, well, we aired on the 31st, uh, so technically uh, it was the last day of the month, mm. but uh, um, you know. Um, we don't disclose our numbers anymore, but it oh, was, it was uh, like th- that November was like two or three X, you know, what the, mm-hmm. the previous month was. Mm-hmm. But for everyone out there who wants to be on Shark Tank, let me also like taper your expectations. It's not this golden ticket where you're on the show and then all of a sudden you go from like one million in sales to a hundred million in sales. Right. Like there's still a lot of hard work and, and uh, there's a lot of companies that they don't talk about anymore who... You know, have either gone out of business or you know they're they're kind of petering along. So yeah. there's, it's not this uh, automatic thing. Uh, the mm-hmm. the success stories are uh, almost like the the rare ones. Uh, within yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. So, but, but it is helpful. It's definitely that that publicity is very helpful. It's huge. Yeah. So let's go back to YouTube for a second, and then because YouTube you've grown, and then Tumblr is big for you too. So talk about the the Tumblr growth and what you do on Tumblr. I love Tumblr. I mean, Tumblr is like a really easy way to curate um, a certain lifestyle that you're going for. And, and they make blogging super easy. Mm-hmm. And uh, you're able to just like convey who you are uh, by curating these uh, photography. So uh, Tumblr was probably one of our first platforms. And, and we're able to produce so much content on there. We, we do something like 10 or 15 posts a day. Seriously? Uh, wow. Yeah. yeah. But That's I mean, it's, it's just the platform allows you to do it. Like that takes maybe 15 minutes of work wow. uh, to do that much content. So it's really a great way to, to be active in front of your audience and and get people to come back. And I mean, it doesn't really drive a lot of traffic to our website, and I don't think it drives like a lot of conversions, but it's just more about building that brand and telling our story that 
it's a, a real useful tool for that. Mm -hmm. And then I know so you have a lot of cool pics and in Instagram. You have a huge following in Instagram too. Yeah, yeah. Instagram, uh, we got lucky and, and had a nice post on, on BuzzFeed. Mm. And that took us from like overnight from like 15,000 to 50,000 right. uh, followers. And, uh, and uh, we've always had like a, a very purposeful type of a branding image of, of we wanted of what we wanted our audience to, to think of when they think of beard brand and and it is that 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 man who wears a beard who's stylish and who cares about his image and and cares about who he is um, so it's it's always been purposeful on, on how we curate yeah. that and Eric so I want to talk about the the product journey a little bit um, what's the what are some of the best sellers that you have well, beard oil is is really our bread and butter. I mean, mm -hmm. beard oil is, it's like for me, it's like my my uh, caffeine, my daily caffeine. I gotta have it. Uh, so, what do you just, use personally what, on a daily basis? Which beard oil? Well, I, I mean, you have a up, large selection here. Yeah, we, we've got nine different fragrances yeah. uh, right now, and uh, that's among four different lines. There's like Lumberyard beard oil, Temple Smoke, Four Vices, Tree Ranger, Spice Citrus. So, what do you like? What are your favorites? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased to a few of them, but mm -hmm. Temple Smoke right now is, for me, is is just, it's it's awesome. Like, I love, it's Oud. I don't know if you know that fragrance. Mm -mm. Um, but Oud is, like, just this really deep, mythical, smoky, mellow kind of mm. uh, aroma. And, uh, I mean, I just love those kind of deep, dark notes. And right. For me, it's, it's just awesome. And, and, like, Four Vices is kind of the same way, but... Four Vices is different because it's just kind of like gritty and dirty and like it's not like something that you would imagine hmm. a fragrance to be. Um, it's very subtle. Like it's not going to, to blow you out of the water. So, um, What's the most popular one for others? Um, the most popular one of our white line is our Yumber Lumberyard. Mm -hmm. And then of our silver line is Tree Ranger. Okay. So, uh, if you're going to go with... with uh, any of those, you, you really can't go wrong with those. But we do have such a wide variety, and, and scent is so personal. Mm -hmm. It kind of depends on on what you like. What did you start with? What were the first first couple? Our silver line. Uh, we launched a silver line all all together. And, so you have uh, a white, a silver, and a gold. Right? Yep. And then we've got uh, the the limited edition black black yeah. one. Yeah. I have a question about that one. That, that, yeah. yeah. That I, looks... I don't want to get ahead. But uh, yeah, so we started with this silver line, and, and that's really our flagship line, and, and that's where if we ever have a new product, we start with our silver line and and uh, kind of go out go out from there. How did you know what to start with? I mean, you can go in any direction with, and there's so many fragrances out there, and yeah, I mean, there's really like a, an infinite right now. Um, for me, it was uh, I got inspired by the name Tree Ranger. Mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, I'm a little bit dyslexic, and I was trying to remember what my my friend did for a living. He's a forester in, in Washington, and I'm like, "What are you? Some kind of?" Uh, I'm like stumbling over my words. I'm like, "Ah, tree ranger," and then like I'm like, "Oh man, that's such like a cool cool term, tree ranger." <laughs> and uh, you know, of course, that's another term that you know I I don't think anyone's ever used before. And bought the domain treeranger.com and. So uh, we use that as inspiration, and then um, so that was my baby, and then my co-founders each kind of developed a fragrance that they thought they were going to love. So Jeremy came up with uh, tea tree; uh, he's a big fan of tea tree stuff. And then yeah. Lindsay came up with uh, spice citrus. So it was more of like three different people, three different types of. Uh, I got fragrance. it. Three personalities, three uh, yeah opinions on that. And yeah. we wanted something like that was kind of different and broad, so that you know it wasn't like all the same so yeah. we, we we try to have like you know the citrus one and the minty one and then the the woodsy one at what point in the journey eric you decide to introduce product because i know for a long time you're just producing content for people in this urban urban beard lifestyle yeah yeah we uh so it was probably about 12 months that we produced content and it was uh, really like kind of seizing opportunities i got contacted by a reporter for the new york times mm -hmm who was going to do a, an article on beard care and yeah. just reach out to me as, as an expert in the field. And so I knew that there was going to be an article. Hmm. And um, with Jeremy and Lindsay, my, my, uh, at the time, I said, hey, do you want to turn this content website into like a real business and, hmm. and sell some products? 
And that was really what sparked the, the product line business of, of Beard Brand. And we, we actually started reselling someone else's products off the, off the gate to get started. Mm-hmm. And uh, just threw it up like literally one day before the New York Times article posted live. And then from there, you know, just that's what business is about, you know, seizing opportunities as, as they come and then working your ass off to, to create. Right. Opportunities. <laughs> what was that first product called that you got? Uh, it was a beard oil as well, just from a, from a, a competitor. Oh, so it wasn't private label that was just there. Yeah, yeah. We were just acting as a retailer. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. We uh, we didn't have our own line of, of products out there. So what made you reach out to those to Jeremy and uh, the other co-founder? Yeah, we had known each other in the business community in, in Spokane, and uh, we had worked together. We were uh, we were kind of like business friends. Uh, we had worked together on a startup weekend mm. um, team, and I don't know if you've ever done a startup weekend, but I've really found a lot of value in it. And it was there that we're like, hey, we work well together. Like. Let's get into business, and we tried doing this other business, um, and we weren't able to get that up and running. Uh, There's too many roadblocks, and and it was like that New York Times where I'm like, hey, I've I've got this opportunity, yeah. other things not taking off. Why don't we just come on board and and do this and and make it work and build? Yeah, I love that. You're like, okay, this big article is coming out. We better have something to sell these people. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So after that, you're selling someone else's product. I like this kind of the, the evolution. When did you first say, okay, we need our own product? How, how long after? Yeah, I mean, I think it was uh, really early in the phase mm-hmm. that, that we had the vision of, of having our own line of products. So for us, it was more of just being able to execute super fast. Mm-hmm. We needed to, to work with another company. But uh, we launched that website really in, in February. It was uh, January 28th, but in, in February of 2000. Uh, 13. Yeah, you guys are good with naming. Beard brand, like some of the names on there are very clever, very catchy. You know, the, the Urban Beardsman beard brand. I love you know, I love it. What Do you have a method for coming up with, with these names? Um, you know, I guess it's just uh, one of my skills. I don't know. Like uh, uh, some of them are, are definitely more challenging than, than others. But my favorite is probably uh, Four Vices. Like that was one of those that uh, I got the name and the concept for the product before we even developed the product. So it's mm-hmm. uh, usually we kind of have this vision for the product before we actually create it. And, and four vices, I'm like, hmm. like the beardsman's favorite vices. Like, what does he love? And it's yeah. ca- cannabis, tobacco, coffee, and hops. And then we brought those. Oh, really? <laughs> That's fine. So, I love that. Yeah. You know, I knew your story, Eric, before you were on Shark Tank. And so my I had a, a hypothesis. Uh, I had a theory. I thought actually Lori was going to invest and start to turn some products into male fragrances. Um, that's what I was predicting, like internally in my mind when I saw the commercials that you were coming on. That's what I thought was going to happen because I knew that you had different, you know, fragrances with yeah. with the beard oil. Um, yeah, obviously- and she she asked me actually about if well, I was going to come out with more product lines and. And uh, the vision is yes, but we're we're really focused on our core right now, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what I told her. And I don't think they were ready for like a long term mm-hmm. investment, but right. yeah, you know, maybe if I told her. <laughs> so with the, with the products, um, you know, I think a challenge with a lot of e-commerce founders is they want to, what do they do next, and how many like what the rate of product development is. What is your strategy on on those two things? Well, the entrepreneur in me wants like a new product every single day right. to be launched, um, but uh, like uh, that's not quite realistic yeah. uh, with with all the things that need to go into production. But um, it, when you have new products, it makes it easy to talk with your customers and, and tell them, you know, what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so ideally, our goal is to have one new product release a month, and sometimes it's as simple as like new packaging, like a smaller bottle or a bigger mm-hmm. bottle. Um, and then sometimes it's uh, like an evolution of like a new type of comb, but it's still a comb. Or, and then other times it's like a completely new product, like a, a beard softener, which no one's ever created before. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, like they all have kind of like varying time levels to get into. And um, but as an entrepreneur, that's part of the challenge is like staying that focus of like what are you at your core, yeah. and um, you know how. How do you stay within your core and, and not get distracted 
And then how do you continue to invest in your business and, and grow um, your business as well? Yeah. So what do you, what goes into the product? How do you create the product? Um, so we'll get like an idea for a concept and, and how we want it to perform and, and how we want it to act and who we want it to serve. Uh, generally, uh, we're really in tune with our audience and our customers because mm -hmm. we are on social media. We engage with our audience. Right. And so we get feedback all the time for what they're looking for and, and what they need. And, and we take all that input and then we, we formulate a product mm -hmm. uh, based on those needs and, and uh, just do a lot of development and testing and, and um, you know, working out all the kinks. And what, do you, what does that look like, the development and testing? Do you like work with a scientist? I mean, is like a formulator involved? How does that, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's a, so we work with a, a chemist uh, definitely for like um, – a lot of the water-based products, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, shelf stability is is uh, paramount concern, and mm -hmm. and uh, um, formulating everything uh, outside of our really outside of our skill set. Um, but there are some some products that, like the oil-based products, uh, and the natural products that, that we can formulate in house, and then uh, work with our our production team to to do all the testing, and and then work with the lab. Uh, to be able to, to test the, the stability of it and uh, um, the expected shelf life and, and all that stuff that, that goes involved with. How with do you product. decide to, where to source it? Because I know you could source it probably, from, you know, some people source stuff from China or U.S. What was your thought process on, on sourcing? Yeah, so for any of our grooming products, anything that's like going on your skin that's going to be made in America, um, not... Uh, a lot of the raw ingredients, you can't have everything made in, in America because, like, does ho doesn't like, grow there. Hobo right. plants even like grow in America? <laughs> right. I don't even, right. You know, so there's like there's some ingredients, of the, the, yeah. Right. Some of those base ingredients, you, you know, and we're a global company too. Like, we're not, uh, we go wherever the quality is. And America's right. got some awesome quality, so it makes it great um, to, to have a lot of, especially in the grooming and cosmetic space, America's probably. The best place uh, to have that produced, but um, um, so we look for wherever that best source is. Right. Um, so Was it did, hard to find? Like, um, I'm yeah, oh, yeah, dude, man. Let me tell you, that's 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 a very challenging part of the business is is finding uh, sources for things and, and finding vendors who can who can not only serve you where you're at today, but also either grow with you or like either you outgrow them or you're not at their stage. Like every company is mm. like. Um, serving a different size company right. and then if you're growing rapidly you know that can all change within five months or six months and you have to completely find different sources right. and you know someone who can keep up with you um, you know and it's just it's a it's definitely it's a giant a challenge. challenge yeah I can see early on initially it's the questions that you ask to find the right source or would be difficult if you've never done it what kind of questions are you asking people to to get go down that pigeonhole to find this is our perfect um, manufacturer and sourcer. Well, I mean, the beauty when when we started, we yeah. we bootstrapped and we started by like just selling one item. So right. it's like, you know, we were making stuff out of the kitchen ourselves. And really putting it together. Yeah, yeah. So we were really like bootstrapping. Wow, then, that's serious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, and then it's like. Uh, um, like, like a really good story I have is with our box maker. Yeah. Right. So I had this, uh, we had this idea for like the, the ultimate bearded kid, like the, the shaving guys had all the fun. They had these beautiful, you know, like, uh, black walnut, uh, razors, like double edged yes. razors. And they're like $300 kits with their shaving bowls and all that crap. And I'm like, where, where's all the premium nice stuff for the guys with the beard? So we went to make like the ultimate beard grooming kit. Right. And, um, so like we just tried to find like a box maker and you can find like at the time we we're only selling like one or two of them. So we'd order like 20, right? 20 boxes, right, right. which, uh, you know, a guy with, with a garage in his backyard can make. And then those things just like, boom, they were like gone. Really? In no time. Uh, yeah. Our customers just loved them. And, uh, you know, so like we tried to find someone who could make in that, like maybe like. 20 to 100 you know units at a time and like there's no one there's absolutely no one out there on the face of the planet so it was like the guy who can make 20 of them mm -hmm. and then the guy who makes like minimum 500 yeah and it's like 
that was like a struggle. And for us, we took a huge risk and we like ordered like 500 right. of them. Because that's, uh, that's a lot of capital for growing business. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's tons of capital. Uh, but it's also like our highest price point unit and it right. moves a lot of products for us. It like sells everything in there. Um, so it was really important for us to have. But it was just uh, that huge risk of, of, finding that vendor and, and that vendor's like, sorry, man, I can't do it. I can't do units less than, you know, 500. And, um, so that's, that was a huge challenge for us to, yeah. to be able to find that, that vendor who could produce high quality, you know, stuff. And, right. And Eric, talk about, you know, you're very customer centric. You're always listening to customers. You're very active on social media. What's something that some of the common things customers were saying and because they were saying it, you created a product. Yeah, that. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, on YouTube, they, they almost ask, like, hey, do a video on this or hey, do a mm. video on that. And and then, um, you know, they're they're really hounding me right now for a beard balm. We've been uh, what is it? Working on. It's a beard balm. OK, so what is that? It's uh, it's similar to a beard oil, but it's a, a solid oh, balm. OK, yeah, balm. Uh, so it's a little bit heavier. It'll give a little bit more control, um, but we want to develop it to, to where it's. It really stands out in the marketplace, mm. um, so we're, we're really fine-tuning it and, and making it, you know, leaps and bounds uh, above everything else. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's just it just it happens every day, you know, and, and yeah. it happens. We get emails, you know, with, with people just saying, "Hey, when are you going to come out with this?" or "What are you going to do that?" or, you know. So besides wow. beard balm, what what else do people want? Yeah, you know, it'll be anything from like uh, brushes to. Uh, you know, like a higher hold mustache wax or, um, you know, they'll, they'll be like crazy items that I don't even know if we could formulate like a, something to waterproof their beard. Like, I don't even know, <laughs> like put some def Teflon on people's beards. I don't know. Maybe I love your explanation of the other, the education, the other beard oils. You're like, you know, a lot of them have silicone in it and it coats it. And the, and the way you explain it is very, you know, educational. And then when you wash it out, it dries out. You know, so I could see why you're getting this feedback from people. But I, as a you know, as business owner, it's got to be hard to what what do you attack first? You know, these are customers who want you to create something so they can buy it. You know, yeah. so what's like what's next in the pipeline if you can share uh, or whatever you can share based off of that customer feedback? Yeah, I mean, we kind of keep it under wraps with yeah. uh, what's coming out. So you just gotta go to the website every <laughs> single day, see see what comes out. But so Talk about the black label, the black marble. Yeah, dude, that stuff is that stuff's gnarly. You know, you we, see, you know, twenty five dollars, twenty five dollars, and then black marble is is eighty dollars. So I'm like, what's in this black marble? Yeah, well, it was a special project with uh, Tobias Van Schneider, who uh, at the uh, was with uh, Spotify as the lead graphic designer, and he's mm -hmm. just like, we've done a profile on him in the past, and he's just like this incredible incredible person like if all you should interview him uh, mm. to talk about someone who's an awesome person what's his name tobias uh, okay. van schneider all right and not uh, too many of those i'm sure if i search yeah. on google <laughs> yeah exactly and he's got a killer beard as well so uh I, I reached out to him and i think i don't know how the conversation came up but we talked about doing a collaboration and he had like really this was uh, a collaboration between uh, us and him, and, and mm. we wanted to create like the most sophisticated, the most luxurious, high-end uh, product on the market. Yeah, uh, we didn't want to spare any expense. We didn't want to limit ourselves with any ingredients. Uh, if we thought it was going to be the best, if we thought it was going to be the most luxurious, then then right. we were going to do it. I love it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we we uh, he designed. Uh, we, he flew into Austin, and and we formulated the. Uh, the uh, ingredients together, and we came up with the the, the fragrance together. Mm. And uh, he designed uh, the packaging as well. And and uh, you know, it comes. We don't show this off. It's it's almost like a little surprise for our customers. But it comes in this beautiful um, um, little box. Uh -huh. uh, it's two box. Design and, is key, right? If you yeah yeah. yeah. So uh, I mean, for us, it was almost like just have this beautiful. Uh, bottle that could just sit on a shelf by itself where people just want to, to display like that was the vision and the right. uh, the goal that we wanted to have with the product and and the way we look at it too is like the stuff the stuff we produce is like super high end and and I know like there's there's always going to be someone 
uh, producing something cheaper out right. there. Right. Um, but we wanted to, to like go the Bentley route or like the, the Rolls Royce route and, mm -hmm. and really produce something that, that no one's done before. And yeah. I think, I think we definitely did it. And like, uh, black marble is a really badass. So what's product. in black marble? Uh, well, it's, uh, our, our base oil really kind of what's special about it is we're using Tamanu oil, okay. um, which is this phenomenal oil to help, um, not only like condition, uh, your, your beard, but it has the ability to help with this. It's called like scarification, the ability for your skin to literally heal. Hmm. So it's interesting. It's a beard oil, but it's also a skincare. To That's help really to cool. Yeah. Keep your skin looking the best. And, and uh, so we, we, we kind of, uh, um, market it as not only a beard oil, but it's also beard oil and skin care. Mm. And, and um, we've got a, um, a higher percentage of, of um, fragrance in there, like natural uh, essential oils that um, is almost in lines with, with like a cologne or a perfume. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's a, just a really premium uh, product. Did you know about that particular oil before you started this formulation? Yeah, or, or is it through the research that you're like, oh, this is the most premium thing we could put in this bottle? I mean, Tamanu oil, I, like, I, I was reading up. I, I mean, I'm immersed in, in, in our products as well and right. just the ingredients out there. And, you know, I just, I don't know how I ran across it, but I ran across it. And I'm like, man, I've got to produce something right. with this in here because it's, it's got, like, some incredible Healing. attributes. Yeah. 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 So it's it's definitely, like, a wonderful uh, oil for your skin. And, 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 you know, that's like the, the people who are going to, to, to invest in that type of product for themselves. It's, it's more than just their beard. It's like taking care of themselves right. and their, their whole body. Yeah. Eric. So two things I want to talk about is, um, what's a must, you know, for e-commerce sellers listening to this, what's a must that works the best for you to boost sales, um, or some of the strategies that work best and then some mistakes to avoid, uh, in the e-commerce e journey. Um, so start with the, what's worked best for increasing sales outside of Shark Tank that's more replicatable? Yeah, I mean, the, the best thing is you, you've got to do two things. Yeah. You've got, well, you got to do a ton of things, right? There's nothing you've got to do, but. <laughs> just two some things, of the most guys. For everyone out there, you just do these two things and yeah, that's two it. Two things no. and it's done, you'll be making millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, like you've got to build trust, right? You've got to help yeah. people understand that the, the people you're working with yeah. Uh, you're you're going to deliver on what you promise, and, yeah. and you build trust a lot of different ways. That's through a well-designed website. Yeah. It's through beautiful photography. It's through reviews on your website where they can read what other people are saying, and it's yeah. like interacting with your your customers and, and talking with them and and chatting with them. Um, so building trust is important, and then it's that authenticity and and doing something that you're passionate about. It's not like companies that just try to get rich and, and make a bunch of money while there's plenty of companies that do that and mm -hmm. are successful. If you're a small guy, it's, it's really hard to, to compete with those. So we like to sell on that, that, that bond that we have with our customers and like building um, or really like I've got a poster, you watch my videos, change the way society views Beardsman. Like that's what we're trying to do at Beard Brand mm -hmm. and being able to unite um, our audience and our customers o along that cause and uh, having our, our products be able to sell or, or fund that process is, is really what moves us. So mm -hmm. being more than just a company that's selling products. Yeah. So like those it's a long-term view. Yeah, it's a long-term view to build the yeah. brand and that's kind of what it seems that you've always been about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's what I have skills doing too. Yeah. Like I don't have skills on, you know, arbitrage and... <laughs> Beating someone in price by a penny to, you know, go after that dude who wants the cheapest stuff out there. Like I, I don't, I don't live that life. I don't buy that way. I'm not trying to find the, the cheapest stuff out there. I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I value my time and my convenience more than, mm -hmm. than a couple of dollars. So, so build trust. What's the, what's the second thing? Build trust and, and be authentic. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess they kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, then it's just hustle. You know, it's just hustle. Tell everyone. Get everything out there. Be passionate. Yeah. If you're doing something you love, it's easy to hustle, you know, because you're passionate about it. You can talk about it for days and months, years. Um, but if you're trying to sell something you don't really care about, you're going to burn out. Like, you, you just, you can't do it. Yeah. Has tough. anything worked in particular with paid advertising that, yeah. that yeah, moves I mean, the needle? Like, 
we, we, we buy ads, uh, we do organic, uh, we do it all, you know, so we, we don't limit, but uh, we do AdWords, we do um, um, a little bit of Facebook. Facebook doesn't work too well for us, uh, and then we do retargeting as well. And then we buy ads on a couple of uh, websites that we support, like Reddit, um, you know, uh, Beard, uh, the Society for the Bearded Gents, um, Accidental Bear, like these are kind of beard-related websites that we mm-hmm. support as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so any celebrity sponsors yet? Yeah, well, we're building our influencer network, uh, which is really cool. And, and uh, we do Urban Beardsman profiles. So mm-hmm. we've had a few people. Uh, we've had Mike Napoli buy some stuff from us who's uh, with the Red Sox. Uh, during their World Series run, he bought some stuff from us. And That's awesome. We've got, uh, I don't know if I can be public with this or not. But well, don't say it if you can't. Well, well just... uh, so we're interviewing uh, Ryan Hurst, who is Opie in Sons of Anarchy. Anarchy. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then uh, if you watch Game of Game of Thrones, uh, Hodor, uh, he's one of our users. So uh, we got a few. I mean, there's, awesome, there's, yeah. there's a lot more I could probably It's probably, is it, do you find it to be a close-knit community as you get entrenched in it or, or not yet? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, especially, well, specifically in, like, the, the beard, uh, competitive bearding world, like, that's yeah. very close. Like, everyone knows yeah. everyone. But the, the broader bearded lifestyle, yeah. I think it's, it's a really big community. Yeah. And a lot of variety out there as well. Like, a, a lot of these guys are really different and really unique and, and really have some, like, awesome stories. Like, our Urban Beardsman profiles, we've, we've got some guys like uh, uh, Patchy Tamer. Uh, he's one of our profiles. He stripped naked at a TED talk what? talking about like uh, homelessness and, and like wow. using his uh, stripping down is, is was like kind of like taking off uh, his baggage that homeless people have and mm. then he put on like fresh clothes that like represented his education and his loving parents and stuff like that. Wow. It's a real interesting talk. So uh, uh, like there's just tons of guys out there like that who wear beards and it's just awesome to be able to tell their story. Yeah. Yeah. So what else has worked well? And, and um, on the journey to selling I mean, beard brand, yeah, I mean it's it's uh, social media has been great for us. Yeah, because, uh, um, we can really like tell that because it's hard to really be like to to really tell like the urban beardsman lifestyle, and you can't do all that when someone's visiting the website on average for a minute and a half, right? You right. know, so it's the tough, website's yeah. about. Uh, but with YouTube, you know, you've got every single video, you've got that ability to right. to print in, and and now that I've got that poster in there as well and in my videos i'm excited that that people are going to know uh, about what we're we're trying to do and what's been the most popular youtube video that you put out uh it's actually a hair hair growing video how to grow your hair out i my wife would love that one. wait tell me about this one. yeah it's just like tips for <laughs> growing your my hair head. Out. No. so uh, i I've, as you can tell I've, I've grown my hair out and uh i'm just telling guys so it's not even related to beards and i'm not even selling anything but we need to so, regrow hair. That that would be like, yeah, yeah. For I, the I, bald I, I, urban beardman. What? Well, I do have. I've got like two or three balding videos as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinning a little bit on the crown, so uh, uh, give it a little. So, bit what do you support. recommend for balding people? My wife will love this. This will be her all-time favorite interview. If you if you tell her, how, no. Well, the beauty with balding. Is yeah. the genes that cause you to bald are, are also the, the genes that cause you to grow a beard. So when it goes down here, you just kind of <laughs> migrate it and grow the beard out. So my recommendation is start growing that beard out, and that's where you're going to be able to, to like style. Like women don't have that ability. Like men are like totally lucky that we got two options. Like if women go thin up here, they're they're pretty much damn. But we we get to grow our beards. Out. Right. Exactly. What about mistakes to avoid? You know, I mean, like in growing a business, like you're going to be making mistakes. And, yeah. and the biggest thing is that you learn from them. And uh, for us, like, you know, we as entrepreneurs, we want to try everything, um, yeah. which is good and bad. You know, um, it's good because you get to make sure what you're doing is right. Uh, but it's bad because it can really distract you from getting away from your core. So mm-hmm. we've we've sold a lot of products in the past that we no longer sell because our customers really didn't want to buy it. Yeah. And, what were a few that you realized? Uh, well, I can show you. Like we've have, uh, they're really cool. Um, like You're like, I have them all here because no one bought them. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's like a beard brand wallet. Okay. Yeah, so it's made out of like full grain natural um, 
natural uh, leather and it's awesome wallet. And then we have like these, uh, oh, I think we still sell our cuffs uh, or we may not, but just like leather products, keychains, stuff like that in mm -hmm. general. And then we sold some shirts uh, that didn't do really well. We've, we've never been able to sell apparel very well. Mm. Um, so it's, um, you know, that kind of stuff, like I got to stay away from, even though I like, I love it and I think yeah. they're super cool. Like my customers, you know, it's not going to put food on my table right. and it's not going to help us with our mission yeah. uh, to, to change the way society views beardsmen. Yeah. No, I love that because now it's a little bit easier in the sense of you get feedback from customers and they're telling you what they want. So you just, yeah. And they tell us with it. action, you know, everyone would right. be like, Oh, that's cool. I have beard brand wallets. And they're like, all right, we got it. Uh, no, I don't really no want to buy it. <laughs> so what else did you learn so far that other people should think about before dipping their toe in? You know, it's, it's um, like uh, business is tough, right? And you've got to surround yourself hmm. with people who can move you forward, who can get you through those tough times. Like yeah. um, I'm very fortunate that my business partners and I, are philosophically aligned, yeah. so um, we're able to focus on building beard brand rather than squabbling over things that some other companies deal with with yeah. their business team. So, like all of our, all of the, me and Jeremy and Lindsay and I, uh, we're all on the same page and we're all working to the same goal, which is super important if you have business partners. Yeah. And for me as well, like I've had a wake of failed businesses um, where I didn't even have business partners, right? Yeah. So for me, like having business partners is is key yeah. um, but I understand it that's also another can of worms like that could be a whole nother podcast right yeah so what's an example of one of the failed businesses and what you learned from it well, well I I, uh, I had a, a vinyl wall graphic business selling uh, little trees and birds and stuff you'd stick on the wall and it was an e-commerce business as well and oh cool I had built, yeah. yeah yeah I built everything. I have one, like this is from wall monkeys and it's yeah. Yeah, it's like a wall decal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, was, I, I sold like two of them, and then uh, the company like I got afraid and I got, um, I got like scared, uh, and I didn't commit to like buying ads. I didn't commit to selling it and, and getting out there, and, and that's all I did. Is I just sold two. What were you afraid of at the time? Failure, which you mm -hmm. know is ironic because you're gonna fail if if you don't do it. But so so it almost scared you when you started getting sales. No, I mean, it just scared me, like, to, to really double down and commit into the business mm. and go all in. Uh, up to that point, everything I had done had been kind of my own time, uh, just hacking it together. Uh, like service-based, like, service -based, like website right, or I've graphic? Right, to build the website, so I built the website. I mm -hmm. designed all the, the decals. I had, like, the social media. I did all the logo, all yeah. that I did in-house. And, I mean, maybe I bought, like, $100 worth of material for the decals. Right. Um, but beyond that, I, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't willing to invest into ads, yeah. and I wasn't willing to invest yeah. into yeah. like really the time it takes to, to sell and build that company. Right. No, Erica, I appreciate you sharing that because everyone in the back of their mind has that that self doubt or some, oh, yeah. some kind of doubt. So how did you get over that fear then? Well, I mean, with that one, I failed, and <laughs> you know, I, I continued to fail uh, until I brought on business partners. Hmm. And, and business, having a good business team, like when you're going through that emotional roller coaster where you're down yeah. here, yeah. you know, hopefully they're going to be up here yeah. and they can kind of bring you up and kind of vice versa where you can level each other out and you can help s stay track on your goals and your vision and, and, and power through everything. Yeah. So uh, that, that team is, is for me, is, is super crucial. Yeah. So Eric, what kind of software do you use to run the business? Use tons of software. I mean, yeah. we've got uh, Shopify, of mm -hmm. course, is our commerce platform, mm -hmm. which I would highly recommend. Uh, Stitch Labs, we use for inventory management. We're on uh, shipping, shipping, sti ship station, shipping easy. Mm -hmm. uh, for our shipping software, we use Google Apps internally. We use Slack mm -hmm. for our chat. We use. Uh, um, geez, Fulfillment. Wobble. What do you use? For, how do you fulfill? Yeah, we work with a fulfillment firm out of uh, Washington's uh, Pacific Northwest Print and Fulfillment mm -hmm. it's a company we use. They're great, great people. Any particular yeah. things that you recommend for people creating high-quality videos? 
Yeah, um, I mean, the best is just to do it and, and to do it regularly. Uh, but in terms of like products, um, you know, just start with your your iPhone. Start with your camera, and yeah, then start simple. Uh, yeah, and then you like don't build too many barriers to get going. And then as you get into it, and there's tons of YouTube videos to help you on how to do it, and I watch mm -hmm. those. So I use an Olympus OMD EM1 camera is what I use, and yeah. then a 25 milliliter. 25 millimeter fixed lens and then uh, I've got a uh, audio as well is very important so I've got like a boom mic uh, or a mm -hmm. shotgun mic that I use yeah what websites Eric do you sell on like Amazon your obviously uh, you Shopify what what uh, websites do you put the products on we sell on beardbrand.com and beardbrand.co.uk and then everything else we work with uh, retailers so mm. we have wholesalers around the world. Oh, nice. Some of those sellers are, are online retailers, but uh, we personally don't sell on Amazon or eBay or, or any other Etsy. We, we, everything's on Beard Brand. So do you let those, whole, those people sell on any site? or uh, We or have no? one retailer who we allow to sell on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, but no one, I'm curious. What's the strategy? Why, why, uh, why that? Uh, Amazon, is uh, what I found, is really for those analytical people who um, um, is all about the numbers and optimization. And we're not those type of people. We're about the branding. And you mm -hmm. can't do branding on Amazon uh, really like we want to do it. Yeah. So um, it's just not our cup of tea. And, um, you know, it would be, we would have our manufacturing business. We'd have our retail business. We'd have our wholesale business. And if we sold on Amazon, we would have our Amazon business. And then we'd have our content business. And that's just really like, Get in your brain uh, to to spread out. So you've got to you've got to really pick and choose what you're you're good at, and don't let the other things be a distraction. Yeah. So what was the decision? Tell me about the wholesaling part of things. Yeah, that's uh, Lindsay. She's my co-founder mm. who who manages that. She's a fantastic uh, sales person, and um, she's got those skills and ability to build the relationships. And we've yeah. got. We've got a lot of customers who just come to us out of the blue who want to carry our products. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, we, we want to take care of them. So what about um, competition? You were saying earlier there's you know competitors sprouting up, and I noticed on one of the you know one of your videos you hold up and it's like this isn't ours. This smells like pine saw. You know, yeah, yeah, how mean, do you have... how do you deal with knockoffs? Yeah, I mean the the thing is we we try to just make it so difficult to to duplicate us. Yeah. Uh, that that no one can uh, can do that. So I think uh, what uh, what we try to do is um, like have a really nice website, have that really good content, have everything like um, just be super polished, where they know that you know this is beard brand, this right. is premium, yeah. and then we try to be everywhere. You know, we try to have our products in Nordstrom and ever products and like men's specialty boutiques everywhere where it's just um, just very hard for someone else to do. Yeah, for sure. Eric, I really appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. Let's uh, just tell people where they can find out more. Um, where should they check you out online? I know you mentioned a few sites, mention them again, and then just leave us with one last um, lesson. Cool. Yeah. So uh, if you Google my name, Eric Banholtz, I'm, I'm the only Eric Banholtz out there. So it will be me. But Twitter is awesome uh, if you want to get a hold of me. And then uh, Beard Brand is uh, our website. And Urban Beardsman is our content website that, that we're really proud of those. And then you can find all of our social media platforms. Yeah. I highly suggest you check out his videos. And also just the, the design and branding is, I mean, the logo is awesome. Yeah, you know, well, I, I love that logo. So just the very simple but elegant branding and design. Check it out. Um, so what's one last last lesson? Where should people start um, thinking about with their e-commerce journey? You know, I, I, I mean, for someone who's just starting, it's just do it, man. Like perfection doesn't happen. Uh, you don't launch with perfection. So you, uh, progress and in, in, in constant improvement is always better. Tesla wasn't invented as the first automobile, right? So uh, you start somewhere and then you gradually improve and, and don't let perfection hang you up. So yeah. just get out there and do it. Eric, thank you so much. Everyone check out beardbrand.com. It's been an absolute pleasure. Dude, the joy is all mine. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thank you. Good.